So John will let us know. Saw the other John Van Valkenburg. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll try to, I'd like to make this short, but I won't be able to because uh, he did a lot of stuff and it deserves to be uh, talked about. So, um, anyway, you know, he, uh, he really was my hero because he was 11 years older than me. So from the time I had my earliest memories, uh, he was already the older, cool guy that did all the cool stuff. So, uh, that was always an inspiration for me. But even though he left when I was uh, only six or seven, he went off and joined the Marines. And uh, but even so, all those memories I have before the age of seven tended to be around uh, our very busy garage, which was filled with other teenage hot rodders. And uh, there was cutting and grinding and welding and spray painting and everything you could imagine going on there and all sorts of amazing things came out of there from good parts to rebuild engines to motorcycles to hot rods and uh, it was just an amazing uh, experience I was always the bratty little kid trying to get as close as I could before I'd get chewed away by the old guys but uh, those are the memories I have is you know from uh, getting grade school basically so um, then, when, by the time he was in high school, he'd already mostly finished his uh, 23T Roadster that uh, was a hu pretty huge part of his life, actually. Um, but it was amazing to me that he and his friends had all built dragsters or hot rods or whatever by the time they left high school. Um, so they all decided to go off and join the Marines together. He went off for six months uh, at Camp Pendleton. And that, he, he loved California so much from that experience that uh, he ended up being here most of his life. But it was really going to Camp Pendleton that uh, sold him on California. But, uh, so he went back to, uh, he came back for a while and was at, at KU, but, you know, I didn't get to see him very much because he was in the Marines, he was at KU, then he went off to work and, and, and stuff. But I, I do remember whenever he was due home, uh, I would sit for hours looking out the front window, uh, waiting for him to drive up. So uh, he eventually talked himself into a job at Douglas Aircraft here in Long Beach and ended up working um, on uh, upper stages of the, uh, what would eventually be the Apollo Moon Rockets. But he wanted to get back to cars, so then he talked himself into a job in Detroit with General Motors. And just, I guess by luck, happened to be in a department with uh, what became some of the uh, future top executives of General Motors, uh, incredible engineers, uh, race car designers. And because they worked with all these projects with um, the top drivers and race car builders of the era, uh, you know, Roger Penske, Mark Donahue, uh, Jim Hollett Chaparral, uh, Smokey Eunuch, all these guys. So he became uh, kind of in that community. And uh, that also ended up uh, defining a big part of his life. I was really lucky because I got to, through him, meet a lot of those guys. And as a, as a teenager, uh, you know, getting to meet world famous drivers and, uh, you know, famous people was, was really a treat for me. Um, uh, Kim Reynolds is here and, and Charlie would know a little bit about this, but uh, one year I went up to the Society of Autom Automotive Engineers show in Detroit to visit him and um, Jim Hall was there with the Chaparral 2J sucker car. And it was on display. And so at the end of the show, when they were loading it on the truck, they needed somebody to steer it while it was being winched up on the truck. So uh, I, I hopped in and uh, steered it onto the truck. So I always tell people I'm one of the handful of people in the world who ever drove the Chaparral 2J. <laughs> so only about 20 feet, but anyway. Um, so while he was up there, 
he, he, he bought a Corvette. The Corvette was stolen, stripped, and burned. So he took that, he chopped the top off to make it a, a, a roadster, and uh, he turned it into a race car. And he got involved in pretty high-level SCCA racing then, became a pretty good driver. And uh, that also was something that he uh, was preoccupied with for uh, quite a period of time. Uh, but he had a lot of uh, stints, uh, for example, going out to uh, Midland, Texas for a few months and uh, was stationed out there at the Chaparral headquarters and uh, got to work with some of the legendary racing cars uh, you know, of all time out there. So that was pretty cool. Um, let's see. So he was up there for, for quite a while. He started, he was doing a lot of instrumentation stuff on cars. And so he ended up getting a job uh, as the technical editor of Sports Car Graphic Magazine in California. And uh, that was Peterson Publications down at uh, Sunset and La Cienega. So he got an apartment next door. So this was like 69, 70 time frame. So things were hopping on Sunset Strip about then. And uh, he, uh, he was also a block from the Playboy Club, so he had neighbors that were all Playboy bunnies and playmates. So, you know, I went to visit him, I thought, it couldn't possibly get any better than this. <laughs> so, but uh, while he was there then, uh, writing for Sports Car Graphic, he got a job uh, teaching a course in race car design uh, at a college. And for the class project, they built a uh, full race Trans Am uh, Camaro. And, I'm, and I don't mean just uh, a Trans Am, like a Firebird Trans Am. I mean an actual race-ready car. So he ended up, at the end of the course, acquiring that car, and then he campaigned that as a private entry in the Trans Am series, where he was competing and, and uh, keeping up with uh, you know, all the major factory teams and the world-famous drivers of the era. I'd hate to forget anything. Um, so around that time, then he wrote his book uh, Chevy Racing, which is a, is a book that I still see mentioned uh, online by uh, in, in race groups and uh, as like a the authoritative um, reference of the various activities of the major race teams of that era and the involvement of Chevy uh, research and development and all that stuff. So that, that's still a sought after a book that's, that's highly uh, referenced. Um, so then he started freelancing and uh, did a lot of uh, uh, testing. He did a lot of testing for uh, road and track, for example. And that was a great thing for me because they were in uh, Newport Beach slash Costa Mesa. And uh, I was working at the time nearby. So every couple of weeks when he had to go down and pick up his car to be tested for that month's issue, he'd give me a call and say, hey, I just picked up this new Porsche racer, Ferrari, whatever it was, <laughs> and uh, you want to go to lunch. So he'd swing by, pick me up, and then we'd cruise down the coast highway in this exotic car, you know, for, for a while. So uh, I really was a beneficiary of a lot of his uh, events in his life as well, so that was great. And somewhere in there, Mark Donahue requested he write co-write his autobiography. Uh, they also collaborated on the um, design of a racing seat, fiberglass racing seat, which uh, which they marketed to other racers. Um, but about the time I went out there, I got out of engineering school, and I went out, and he had, he had just finished the book, Donahue's uh, biography, and uh, just a few months after I got out there, um, Mark was killed in a, in a racing accident, well, a car accident, and um, I just remember his, I'd never seen him as despondent as that, and it really, I could tell it really, because they'd gotten to be good friends, and uh, uh, he was friends with their family, and it kind of, I think, turned his attitude towards racing, and uh, I had a discussion with Mary uh, that he started thinking that racing was too dangerous, and he kind of started backing off a lot of that stuff. But uh, he, did, he did continue on his, all of his freelancing. And, you know, he tested just about everything. He tested snowmobiles, uh, three-wheel cars, uh, school buses, uh, 
instrumenting all these things. Take, take, if you can imagine taking a, a school bus out on the skid pad, but you know that's the sort of thing he was doing. A lot of it were, a lot of these things were government contracts where they were, you know, safety testing and that kind of stuff. Um, he also around that time got involved in the Human Powered Vehicle Association, and uh, for a time held some world record in in his class uh, for human powered vehicles, and he got to fall in with another whole batch of uh, famous engineers that were involved in that, including the guy who eventually built the human-powered airplane that flew across the English Channel. So he, uh, that was a whole another few years of uh, being sidetracked on another interesting and uh, uh, unusual uh, project. Um, he, around that time, too, eventually he started teaching a class of hybrid vehicle design at Cal State Long Beach. And so he got really interested in building electric cars and hybrid cars and so on. And uh, he, he, got, he, he wanted to build, design a car that could be built cheaply in the backyard in uh, a country, a third world country. And so he got interested in bamboo, and he built uh, a car and uh, made plans available to people who wanted to build a car out of bamboo plywood that was powered uh, electrically. And uh, his prototype is in the garage over at the house, right, at this very moment. So if anybody's interested in that, it's, it's available. <laughs> um, he, he got involved in more, he, he really got away from vehicle stuff, and he got more involved in uh, migraine research, uh, tinnitus research, uh, a, number of, a number of other fields, and uh, also really started, you know, about that time he was raising his family, and, you know, so he ended up with three delightful boys who were here today, and uh, devoted more of those years uh, to uh, just being a dad. And, and raising his kids, and uh, so there we are. I, I, I guess that's kind of a long story, but I just touched on all the many uh, varied and unusual and exciting things that he was ever involved in. So I, I just hope that uh, some of that legacy, uh, you know, I can convey some of that legacy because it's very important to me. But anyway, he, uh, we miss him, but. Uh, he lived a long life, and it was a very full life, and it was well lived. So. Thank you, John.